Welcome to the webinar Tools for Building Energy Efficiency Resources for Policy and Project Progress Tracking, hosted by Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency in collaboration with World Resource Institute. This webinar is organized under the umbrella of Sustainable Energy for All Building Efficiency Accelerator as part of its thematic webinar series. We are pleased that 135 people have registered for this webinar. My name is Ksenia Petrichenko and I'm a researcher at Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency. Copenhagen Center uh, conducts research and advisory activities in the field of energy efficiency and serves as energy efficiency hub for sustainable energy for all initiatives. I would like to introduce you to our speakers today. We have great uh, panelists, um, Shannon from World Resource Institute, uh, representing Building Efficiency Accelerator, Alex also from World Resource Institute, Michael from Eclair USA, and Eric and Rose from the city of Milwaukee. We'll uh, start after this uh, welcome and instructions uh, given by myself. We will uh, hear about Building Efficiency Accelerator work in different cities, given by Shannon, and then I'll give a brief overview of uh, our work with WRI on tools for energy efficiency in buildings. And we will hear about several case studies on utilization of the tools for tracking progress on, of policies and projects in the field of energy efficiency in buildings, starting with Global Protocol for Community Scale Greenhouse Gas Emissions by Alex. And then we will hear about ECLAS to Clear Path. Um, uh, Michael will introduce us to this tool and uh, at the end we will hear about experiences from the city of Milwaukee using tools for tracking progress in their uh, energy efficiency efforts at the city level. We will conclude with questions and answer session so please feel free to post your questions at any time during the webinar using the question function on your GoToWebinar panel. You can also indicate which speaker you would like to address your question to. That will be very helpful. Uh, there will be a short survey at the end, so please stay throughout the whole webinar and uh, we will very much appreciate if you will spend a couple of seconds to fill out a very short survey. It will help us a lot for our tracking efforts. And um, I would like to draw attention that Building Efficiency Accelerator is conducting various uh, thematic webinars on a regular basis and all materials including recordings and representations of all previous webinars you can find at uh, Copenhagen Center Knowledge Management System. You can see the link below. Uh, in the learning se section we have a shortcut for Building Efficiency Accelerator webinar collection. And so far we have 12 webinars, plus we will have all the materials from today's webinar uploaded shortly uh, afterwards. And we have next webinar coming already on Monday uh, on Toolkit for Buildings. So please feel free to join and register already today. It will be a great webinar as well. So with this um, brief introduction, I would like to hand over to uh, Shannon to give an uh, overview of uh, Building Efficiency Accelerator's work. Shannon, the floor is yours. Thanks, Xenia. Um, welcome, everyone. As, uh, as Xenia said, my name is Shannon Hilsey. I am uh, working on Building Efficiency at the WRI Ross Center for Sustainable Cities. For those of you who've joined previous webinars by the BEA, you probably don't need this background but I'd like to give just a brief introduction to the Building Efficiency Accelerator Partnership for those of you who are new. Um, in 2010, Secretary General Ban Ki-moon launched UN Sustainable Energy for All, an initiative to provide 100% access to sustainable energy sources worldwide by 2030. And under that initiative, one of the three sub-objectives is a doubling of the global rate of improvement in energy efficiency worldwide by 2030. To achieve that goal, SE for All created six sector-specific energy efficiency accelerators, of which buildings is one. So um, the building efficiency accelerator grew out of that and currently um, is comprised of over 35 global partners. 
Now, um, we want to assume that for those of you dialing in, you may not need an introduction to why building efficiency is important on a global scale, but I would like to give just a brief uh, idea of the way that we think about it here. We often talk about the economic opportunity, the social gains that can come out of building efficiency um, concerning health and improved energy access, the huge environmental opportunity. But I think as we're talking about this 2030 goal, one of the most compelling um, pieces of information that we often talk about is the long lifespan of buildings and the fact that if we're talking about a 2030 goal, um, that's 14 years from now, which means that buildings that are built today in an unsustainable rather than a sustainable manner are locking in high energy costs um, and negative environmental effects for potentially you know, eight to ten times the length of time toward that goal. So it really uh, focuses in on the urgency of what we're dealing with here. To help address those opportunities and challenges, the um, Building Efficiency Accelerator partners provide technical and, uh, and other support for global partner jurisdictions. Um, institutional partners to the Accelerator come from the NGO community, from associations, uh, private sector companies, and more. And as I said, there are currently over 35 institutional partners working together to provide services to our 23 as of now, partner jurisdictions. BEA partner jurisdictions currently come from every global region. Um, there are plenty of opportunities for more jurisdictions to become involved. So if you're interested in starting a conversation about what it would mean to become partner jurisdiction, please reach out to us. And just as a beginning of um, an introduction to that, the cities that join the Building Efficiency Accelerator contribute to this overarching commitment of doubling the rate of improvement in energy efficiency in the building sector by committing to implement one enabling policy, a demonstration project, and the creation of a tracking mechanism against their baseline for progress toward those goals. In turn, the institutional partners provide a variety of resources, including guidance on an action prioritization process, um, tools and other solutions delivered through a variety of mechanisms like these webinars and guidance on funding opportunities and potential opportunities for international recognition of their actions. The partnership was just launched this year, but we have already um, been able to engage with our partner cities in a variety of forums, global events, uh, kickoff meetings, and regional and global trainings um, on content areas, one of which the Tracking Progress content area is delivering this webinar today. So as I said, if you're interested in learning more, please get in touch with us. And with that, I would like to hand off to Ksenia. Thank you, Shannon. Uh, indeed, uh, Building Efficiency Accelerator has been doing a lot of work in a number of cities and one of the areas which uh, Accelerator has been collaborating on with the Copenhagen Center on Energy Efficiency was to deal with tools on energy efficiency in buildings. Um, the main goal of this uh, collaborative work was to analyze and map publicly available tools and information sources related to energy efficiency in buildings in order to assist local policy makers in accelerating their efforts on energy efficiency improvements uh, in buildings. So we managed to collect together about 50 uh, tools and information sources and analyze and group them uh, in according to several criteria. We looked at the uh, approach which the tool or resource takes and we distinguish between passive and interactive tools. Passive tools mainly include um, tools which provide data and uh, information or guidelines but don't have the interactive calculating component as opposed to interactive tools which may provide opportunities for various assessments, uh, scenario building and uh, getting some interactive uh, results. 
we distinguish between project and policy tools, with policy tools uh, aiming to support policy efforts and help um, policymakers to design, to choose, design, and implement uh, various policies in um, energy efficiency in buildings. Project tools are those ones which target specific uh, project in the area of construction of uh, renovation of buildings and help to either choose specific measures uh, to improve energy efficiency in buildings, calculate energy efficiency savings from uh, different measures, as well as assess uh, other impacts of the projects. We'll look at different stages of the policy development cycle and uh, we identify five of them. I will talk about them in more details a bit uh, uh, later. And as you can see, one of the stages is tracking progress and that's our focus uh, today for this webinar. And as we um, work with cities under umbrella of building efficiency accelerator, city focus was an important criteria uh, for looking at various tools and here we distinguish between tools which specifically target city level and are designed for um, work with cities and there are also tools which uh, are more generic and uh, can be implemented at other cities, uh, at other levels, not on the city level, so we call them supporting tools. The results of uh, this work are presented in two recent publications. One uh, was launched by uh, World Resource Institute this spring and there is an annex which overviews various tools according to this methodology. And in support to that, um, Copenhagen Center recently launched a working paper together with uh, WRI which provides more details on the approach and various tools um, which we looked at. You can download both publications online and uh, the working paper is available on our knowledge management platform. So I mentioned that uh, policy development cycle is in the core of the methodology which um, we developed for mapping and analyzing the tools. And uh, based on that we developed a decision making tree as uh, we call it. Uh, you can't see the details here but on the next slides I will uh, go through different stages. This is just um, a snapshot uh, to show you how it looks like. Um, you can find more details in the working paper. So um, the first stage we looked at, uh, we call it scoping, um, and this is the stage where it is important for the city to create some sort of a baseline to collect and analyze data on the local situation and for each of the stages of the cycle we try to identify in a very simple manner, not to overload um, the target audience too much, uh, key questions which policymakers or experts might face in their policy and project development efforts. Uh, and for each of the questions we were trying to map what are the tools which can be helpful in order to answer these questions. I'm not going to go into details for each of, uh, on each of the uh, stages because actually for each of the stages we have uh, a dedicated webinar which was focusing uh, on each of the stage and looking at uh, case studies of the tools which belong to this stage. So for the scoping and uh, the next stage and identification of the policy option stage uh, we had a webinar last year in November and we looked at common carbon metric by, developed by UNAP and TRACE tool for the series developed by World Bank. But basically these tools <clears throat> can help to establish the baseline, look at what are the key barriers on energy efficiency in buildings are in the local uh, situation and identify what are the key policy instruments which can uh, city develop or improve in order to address existing barriers you know, for energy efficiency, how they can be prioritized and put in the policy package. That brings us to the Next stage, the policy design, and this is a very important stage as um, we always uh, trying to advocate for a holistic approach for policy development and not for a single solution in terms of uh, policy instrument. There are certain guidelines um, in, uh, in the world of uh, building efficiency sources and uh, tools which can help to create an effective policy uh, 
uh, package and align and tailor it to the local situation. There are also tools which collect existing policy practices from different uh, jurisdictions and different locations which can be helpful for the city to look at um, and see what are the lessons learned uh, which they can use. And of course it is very important to <coughs> include energy efficiency multiple benefits in the policy development uh, process in order to be able to communicate to different audiences and um, to show that it is not only about reducing kilowatt hours but uh, there are many other benefits in terms of health improvement, job creation, um, uh, solving or reducing the problem of uh, energy poverty, increasing energy security and so on and so forth which can be helpful to include um, when we talk about creating an effective policy uh, package. We also have a webinar, um, we had a webinar this March which was looking at different tools on policy design and um, IEA was talking about their different tools. We had a big AE platform uh, demonstrating the abilities of their tool uh, to create policy packages and the uh, UNEP Spot Handbook uh, which is a um, a very comprehensive handbook which looks at different policy instruments and the way how they can put into the policy packages. At the next stage, uh, the policies which uh, were identified or package which was developed has to be implemented and translated in certain actions. Um, and here we identify uh, tools which uh, can support projects or policies for new or retrofit buildings. So in the, in the working paper you can find more information on each of them and uh, in our webinar uh, in June we looked at uh, three case studies of the tools uh, ECLA Solutions Gateway which provides guidance on how uh, different policies can be implemented, uh, C40 Good Practice Guides which also provide uh, guidance on implementation of um, energy efficiency and sustainable energy policies in buildings and IFC Edge tool which um, is uh, from, from the part related to the project implementation which helps to design more energy efficient buildings and choose among different measures which can be in, integrated into the green building design. So today we're talking about the tracking stage or evaluation and reporting stage and um, <clears throat> this is a very important stage because it is important to understand and demonstrate the impact of the implemented policy and project projects in the, um, in, in, in the improvement of building energy efficiency. It is crucial to evaluate, monitor and track progress and take into account various parameters. So here are different uh, tools can offer different opportunities depending on the on the aim and the objective of the tracking. There are tools which uh, offer opportunity to create inventories of uh, energy efficiency and greenhouse gas emissions in buildings and try to look into the future impacts of various policies or actions. There are tools which uh, can help to construct scenarios and also see what are the energy savings potential from and different assumptions are. Um, there are benchmarking tools which can help to uh, demonstrate the progress made uh, from actions in certain jurisdictions and compare them to a uh, set of benchmarks. So today this uh, webinar is focusing on some of these tools and it is uh, great to have several case studies presented today. Uh, as I mentioned, we will talk about greenhouse gas emissions protocol developed by World Resource Institute, ClearPath developed by ECLE, and City of Milwaukee will share their experiences on using Portfolio Manager uh, tool to track progress in their city. With this, I would like to conclude my um, brief introduction in our work on uh, analyzing the different tools and hand over um, to Alex who is going to talk about greenhouse gas emissions uh, protocol. Thank you very much. Alex? Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, so uh, I will be talking today about the greenhouse gas protocol uh, policy and action standard. 
Um, and as, as mentioned previously, I'm uh, with WRI uh, along with Shannon, who, who presented a bit earlier. Um, and the, the greenhouse gas protocol is, is a uh, convened by WRI and the World Business Council for Sustainable Development. Um, and we provide greenhouse gas accounting and reporting standards, sector guidance, calculation tools, and, and trainings um, for monitoring and, and accounting for developing inventories for um, a series of different purposes. Um, the standards that, that we have kind of developed over the years and we, and we keep working on um, are, kind of cover a, a series of entities and projects and, and other perspectives. The um, policy and action standard in the bottom left of the screen here is the one we'll be talking about today and, and its applications in the building sector, um, specifically kind of running alongside the, um, <coughs> excuse me, well, this presentation will kind of be following the format of the document, which is a, um, a, a large kind of collection of um, accounting and reporting information and, and um, which, which guides the user through um, how to develop a, a robust inventory best, based on uh, widely agreed upon best practices um, in order to account for the greenhouse gas impacts and effects of, of policies and actions um, at, at many different levels. So the purpose of the, of the standard um, is to help users assess the greenhouse gas effects um, of policies and actions in an accurate, consistent, transparent, complete, and relevant way. Um, those are essentially the greenhouse gas accounting uh, principles to follow in, in, in any case. Um, and, and the kind of objectives and purpose of this is to help policymakers develop effective strategies for managing and reducing greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so bringing into the consideration the greenhouse gas impacts of, of many of the, the assortment of policy options that, that policymakers have uh, at hand. Um, and the idea of a standard uh, in general is to support the consistent and transparent reporting of these emissions impacts to, to help shed information and light on um, the, the policy choices and, and to provide that kind of extra layer of, of transparency and accountability. The standard was developed for uh, a, a wide range of users and um, it, it is, is quite robust and, and applicable to um, many different uh, entities and approaches. Um, it went, underwent a, a very thorough development process um, with a lot of inputs and, and it was a kind of consensus-based multi-stakeholder approach, um, which is how a lot of these standards are developed, uh, pilot tested widely. Um, throughout the world, a lot of different geographic areas and, and, and representation. So the presentation here is set up um, kind of to mirror the, the contents of the, of the standard of the document, uh, which is freely available online at the Greenhouse Gas Protocol site, ghprotocol.org. Um, the first step in identifying and, 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 and uh, doing the accounting and reporting um, is defining the objectives and to define the specific policy or action, the information which would help kind of set up the boundaries and, and identify specifically what is being covered and all of the relevant information there. So the, the idea is to start off with um, being very clear and intentional about the objectives of assessing the policy or, or, or action that is, that is creating this greenhouse gas impact, um, and that will inform the policy selection and design. Uh, it will help evaluate policy effectiveness and um, identify which greenhouse gas effects or policies are, are being included within the, the boundaries of the assessment. So the chapter five, if we're skipping ahead a little bit, um, is, is again one of the first activities to undertake um, in, in conforming with the standard. Um, it's defining the, the boundaries. And so that includes selecting the policy to be assessed um, and clearly defining the policy 
and then deciding whether to assess an individual policy or package, and then choosing whether you're looking at a forward projection um, or looking at um, some type of kind of past historical greenhouse gas effects of, of, a, of an action or policy that's already implemented. And when, when I say policies and actions, uh, it kind of runs the, the gamut of, um, of all these examples here where you have regulations and standards where you have subsidiaries or other incentive programs um, and all sorts of kind of policies and actions that can be um, used to, to kind of affect change. So in the, the first phase of clearly defining the policy or action, there's essentially a checklist of information that, that should be included uh, to, be, to be compliant with this kind of standard of information um, and includes an overview of, of the policy or action, uh, identifying information about the timeline and, and time scale and about the scope and the, essentially the assessment boundaries of, uh, of what is being looked at um, through many different dimensions. Um, also identifying, again, whether it is a um, forward-looking projection of the greenhouse gas effects uh, over a certain period of time into the future, or an ex-post assessment looking at um, the kind of historical greenhouse gas effects or contributions of something where you can use the kind of observed greenhouse gas effects information um, rather than making projections forward. So in identifying the effects, um, one of the first exercises is mapping the causal chain. And um, the idea behind this is to identify all of the kind of tangential and intersecting policy interactions um, that, that may be causing greenhouse gas effects um, with a specific policy that's being considered. Um, and all kinds of effects can be, can be uh, should be considered and, and through kind of a thorough analysis of of what is being, um, what, what policy is being enacted or, or analyzed, um, including intended and unintended consequences, of short and long term, um, regardless of jurisdiction and regardless of if it is increasing or expected to increase or decrease greenhouse gas emissions. And so, a causal chain, uh, mapping the causal chain to find the greenhouse gas effects kind of looks like this, where you have the specific policy or action um, and then a, branches that, that come out from that of um, the, the first stage effects, which, which we'll see an example in a second, and then, and then the effects, the kind of intermediate effects that are the result of that, and then any kind of greenhouse gas effects that are the result. And so this is just mapping out um, all of the kind of policy interactions and, and potential greenhouse gas effects that, that may result as a, um, from, from the policy in question. So for example, a, a home insulation subsidy um, may have two branches to start out where the first intermediate effects are that consumers purchase and install the insulation, as you would hope and expect. Um, but the other side of that would be businesses producing more insulation, which increases emissions from manufacturing. Um, and so if you follow the, the top chain, you get the secondary effect where you reduce the demand for electricity and natural gas uh, to heat homes. That in turn reduces electricity generation and reduces emissions from uh, home natural gas use. Um, those kind of GHG policies or GHG effects kind of have their own um, kind of linkages down the chain. Here's an example that was um, used in, in one of the pilot studies in, in a Tunisia solar program um, where you can see they have a, a number of kind of different identifying marks to show where, um, where GHG effects were determined to be uh, more prominent and, and they have a temporal dimension as well. So then the next step in defining the assessment boundary is assessing the significance of, of each of those greenhouse gas effects um, by looking at the likelihood that they occur and the relative magnitude of their impact or effect. And there's some, some rule of thumb guidelines that are included in in the standard itself as, as, as to how to kind of determine the likelihood of each of these. But the, as a rule of thumb, um, the, the more likely and the more major the, the effect, um, then it, the calculation to determine those greenhouse gas impacts should be included uh, as well.
And so if we apply that to the home insulation subsidy, um, we, we look at the, all the greenhouse gas effects that are identified here and, and the likely green, uh, greenhouse gases to be um, considered. And then we do this uh, kind of exercise of identifying whether they should be included or excluded. Um, and then identify the greenhouse gas emissions from which specific um, effects should be calculated. Um, and then kind of go back to the chain and look at, at how they kind of fit together and work. Um, and then kind of go forward to, to identifying the, the equations and, and information needed to calculate those emissions. So if we have a summary of the effects here, you can see that um, these are the greenhouse gases we'll be looking at for the specific greenhouse gas effects included in the assessment. So, and I'll skip through this rather quickly. Um, a lot of this information will be available um, in, in the slides, all, this, all the slides will be available afterwards, um, and, and also the, the standard upon which these are based uh, freely available as well, so, so feel free to take a look at these. But the basic steps in estimating the effects are to estimate the baseline scenario emissions then the policy scenario emissions and to just find the difference between them. So essentially, if you are looking at um, an ex ante scenario, um, you, you're developing this baseline scenario and then the uh, the effect of, of that implementing the policy, so implementing potentially the um, housing sub or the, the insulation subsidy, and then the GHG effect being the difference between those two. In the Tunisia pilot, for example, um, their analysis indicated that, that they had you know, a, a baseline at a certain level and a policy scenario emissions at a certain level, so the uh, GHG effects in total were the, the difference between those two lines. So if we are going through really quickly to estimate the baseline emissions, the GHG sources um, from the home insulation subsidy example, um, we'll just take a quick look at the residential natural gas and combustion. You come up with the calculation and the, the parameters needed. Um, you identify kind of the methodology that you're using and the assumptions that are, that are included in that baseline, um, and then you execute the calculation. Uh, and, and plug it in. And then the aggregate effect of, of doing that for each of those becomes the baseline emission um, metric for, for that baseline scenario. Um, and there, there are kind of differences between using and uh, doing an ex ante baseline scenario and an ex post where you're looking at the uh, historical values. Um, and I'll, I'll skip ahead here just to save a little bit of time, but um, estimating the policy scenario, this is when you're considering the, um, the assumptions in the inclusion of the um, insulation subsidy. So you're looking at the um, assumptions if you had assumed that the policy has taken hold and you include kind of all of the metrics around um, the, the information that you are, you are assuming in that policy scenario and you, you similarly execute the calculations um, and then plug those in to find the change in emissions that would be uh, attributable to the policy. So here we have uh, reduced emissions from uh, electricity generation, reduced emissions from home natural gas use, but increased emissions from insulation production that are directly attributable to the policy in question. And so the overall effect um, becomes kind of the summation of those effects. Um, there's also more information about monitoring going forward and, and guidelines for how to set up a monitoring and performance um, uh, scheme to, to follow going forward. And there's the example of Tunisia um, and their, their kind of solar um, project. Uh, and then there's also information on, uh, if I get to it, on reporting the results and what information should be included in um, kind of the reporting and public reporting of this type of assessment. Um, there's the information around the assessment, there's a description of the policy or action that were developed during the initial stages, um, estimated changes, so the, the results of those calculations and descriptions of the methodology and, and additional optional reporting information for uh, more clarity and transparency. Um, and then there's suggested, um, we have additional resources um, on greenhousegasprotocol.org if you're looking to 
find um, more information about how to apply this standard. Um, but I think that's that's my time, and I'll be handing it off now to, to Michael Steinhoff from ICRI US. Um, Mike, take it away. Thank you, Alex. Okay, great. You all should be uh, seeing my screen now, and uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, some of the options for uh, progress tracking both at the, uh, say, community scale inventory level as well as some uh, individual project tracking uh, functions within our ClearPath tool. Um, just a quick intro on what is ClearPath. Um, it is ICLE USA's online emissions management platform. Um, it does a, a number of things, um, including uh, creation of uh, GPC compliant um, inventories for the community scale. Um, it also includes some dynamic forecasting features, um, decision support and scenario planning for developing climate action plans, um, tracking of, of the implementation of actions within that plan, um, long-term emissions monitoring as, as possible within the tool. Uh, and it also does this on both the community scale and government operations tracks. Um, that full suite of, uh, of features there are, are things that are included in the full platform, uh, what we call ClearPath Pro. Uh, this is a, a resource that is free to ICLE USA members, um, as well as uh, all local governments in the state of California through a program we have there called the Statewide Energy Efficiency Collaborative. Um, outside of those two options, um, there are more limited versions of it. Um, there is a community scale inventory, inventories only um, module that is called ClearPath Basic. Um, that is free within uh, the US to all local governments for the compact of mayors. Um, and then there is a, a separate but, but essentially equivalent version of ClearPath Global um, that is really just focused on GPC inventories um, that is available worldwide, uh, also through the Compact of Mayors. And that version of the tool is, is also available in French, Spanish, and Portuguese. Um, you know, I will note, however, that, that um, essentially all the features that I'm demonstrating today are unique to the US version. Um, and some of them to the to the pro version. So just a, a word of caution there. Um, quick, uh, just a note on the number of folks using ClearPath. Uh, we have a pretty big footprint here in the U.S. Uh, with uh, over 650 individual users in uh, 367 different jurisdictions, and they've done quite a lot of inventory work. Um, lots of lots of inventory data going in there. Um, smaller footprint on the global scale. Um, with just about a dozen cities who, who have picked up the, the tool to do inventories um, at this time. Um, so just some, some framing for uh, thinking about you know what, what ClearPath does for progress tracking, um, particularly because it is uh, initially geared towards being an, an inventory tool. Um, one of the challenges there, of course, is that inventories are often done at a pretty course scale, right? You're dealing with aggregate uh, annual energy use in broad categories like residential, commercial, industrial, and so on. Um, so, so you know, you lose some resolution there for really talking about, well, how much progress are we making? Um, you know, you can have multiple inventories over time and you can see what's happening to the totals, um, but you may have uh, aspects within that that are uh, potentially masked by growth in the sector, population growth, uh, economic development, those sorts of things. Uh, and there's also just sort of a lot of noise in inventory data that, you know, from weather impacts to economy, uh, lots of things going on that, that may um, make it hard to, to really demonstrate progress over time. Um, but there are options. Um, so one of those options, um, of course, is in the process of doing your greenhouse gas inventory, um, cr creation of indicators, um, anything that you can incorporate about activities related to the, the inventory data that tells you about what the drivers 
really were uh, for that particular inventory that you can then normalize against um, and, and really track progress over time. So you know, things like energy and emissions per household or per uh, square foot of commercial building space or, or you know, any number of those kinds of indicators would be helpful. Um, so, so that's um, one of the features that I'll be demonstrating here uh, within the clear path tool. Um, but again, this, this indicators based tracking takes time to reveal this sort of progress. Um, so if you're, you're getting started doing an inventory now or soon, uh, definitely encourage you to be thinking about developing those kind of indicators as you do it. Uh, it should pay off in the long run. Uh, so now I'm going to switch over to uh, the, the ClearPath tool to do the demonstration. Uh, we'll talk about the indicators. I'll also look at um, a few other features of the tool for uh, tracking overall uh, inventory progress against business, business as usual projections or um, as, as Alex was just talking about, uh, sort of baseline scenarios. Um, and then tracking the impact of individual actions against a projected impact uh, from, a, from a scenario developed in the tool. So as I switch over here to the uh, to the tool itself, um, you can see in here I have a number of different inventories. Um, this is uh, I want to talk a bit about the the indicators tra tracking. So I'll go into uh, to this early one uh, from from 2010, and I can see I'm I'm tracking residential natural gas here and, and electricity consumption. Maybe I know something specific, and I'm able to track, uh, let's say, a certain uh, zip code or, or postal area or some other subset of my my total city um, on an individual basis, and, and I can see that okay, I've done this. You know, maybe it's a subset, smaller um, number of folks in my in my community, so that I have an, an amount of electricity used, and the number of households in this case is our is our indicator uh, drove this. Um, consumption of electricity and you know in the bottom you get all your your emissions outputs per the uh, doing the inventory but also a couple of nice uh, indicator values on okay well how much energy and emissions was that per household um, so now if I go on to uh, a, a subsequent inventory, let's say my, my 2013 inventory, and um, I've got my other two electricity and natural gas, I'm going to create a new record here for that is sort of the next updated next updated version of that um, of that subset of my inventory, right? Um, so I'm going to enter in some information here. And maybe another number of households for, for this record. Um, I've got new indicator values here. And I can save that. Um, you know, and, and if I were to look at this um, at the, the sort of global level of the inventory level, I could see that, oh, well, emissions increase. Um, that that can be a, a, a harder story to tell or to explain uh, to your stakeholders about the progress you're making. Uh, but maybe you can tell something better uh, if you have the, the right indicator values. Um, so now if I switch over to, to the reports portion of the tool, I can go and run this indicator report. And you can see I've done these these indicators for a number of things. I've got my my three inventories here: 2005, 2010, 2013. Um, and I can now go in and find here are those uh, those indicators, and I can see this last set of values that I just created there, um, and actually being able to tell this better story about the improved impact um, tracking this finer detailed progress over time while we're doing the, uh, the high-level greenhouse gas inventory. Um, you know, it's essentially the same process that, that you could go through for uh, all of the different other sectors. Um, you can see things like uh, the indicators that we've got set up in here uh, for the different sectors are, are, are appropriate for, the, for each individual sector. So commercial sector, for example, is talking about um, square feet of floor area as opposed to households, uh, that sort of thing is, is uh, what's baked into the tool. 
Now, a few other uh, additional tracking features that are available. Um, I'm just going to run through some high-level uh, features to, to just set the, the stage for this. So the tool does include um, a business as usual or, or baseline scenario projection capability. So you would create that here. Uh, then you can create sort of ex-ante uh, estimates of uh, actions. Uh, explore the, the impact of starting them at, at different times and, and you know this gap here would be the, the impact of those actions uh, from an ex-ante point of view. Um, but then of course we want to be able to track um, how these things are, are, are functioning so I can come here to what, what we have in the monitoring module um, and this is essentially a way that we can uh, take um, create an annual instance of, okay, what was the performance of a particular uh, action that we were undertaking. Um, this is going to pull from the, the, the actions that are defined in my scenarios. Uh, depending on what this is, it will allow me to track whatever the, the, the main driver uh, of that action was. So in this case, let's uh, think about um, uh, a, a solar capacity, uh, increased solar capacity uh, action so I can track, you know, how much of this action did I do. Um, there's a lot of sort of qualitative things and information about financing and, and whatnot that you can track here as well. Uh, but I also want to talk, uh, of course, get um, how much, let's say, energy I produced with this action. Um, so it's going to save some values here for, for electricity in this case, for the solar, and I'll save this record. Um, now the reports um, allow me to do some other interesting things about, um, you know, I can look at any number of my uh, scenario plans that I've developed for, for an action plan, and now I can see, um, you know, for each one of these actions, uh, what I plan to do in the initial, initial scenario, um, each instance, each record of that uh, that I just created, so actually it would be this one over here uh, for the 2015 commercial PV. Uh, so we planned to have that much capacity installed. We only did 1,100, so there's a gap here. And we can use this information to, to say, okay, well, are we, are we actually doing what we plan to do um, in, the, uh, in our action plan? Um, then we can also look at it in terms of, well, are we getting the uh, impact out of it that, that we thought, um, and how well are we uh, actually staying true to um, uh, the, the climate action plan that we developed and the scenarios, the ex-ante scenarios that we developed, um, so with the actual performance. Um, and in this case, I can see both uh, here for the, the commercial when I can look at it in terms of energy um, as well as the emissions component of that um, and whether or not we're, we're staying on track. And at least in this case, we're, uh, we, we got over the hump and are doing at least better in 2015 than we uh, projected we would do. So those are the, the um, you know, essentially the, the kind of individual project level tracking features that are within the tool. Um, there are, of course, a number of other ways that, that you can look at uh, progress over time uh, that, that the tool includes. So um, if you've developed those scenario plans or those baseline uh, projections, you can compare actual inventories. Um, so in this case, I had a, a, a baseline projection that started with my 2005 inventory that, that maybe I made many years ago. Um, but now I've got a couple other inventories in here, my, my 2020. 10 and 2013 inventories, and I can start to track, you know, within the sector, how am I doing uh, as compared to what we thought we were going to do. You can also run these reports against um, uh, scenario plans and, um, you know, the, the uh, climate action um, plan scenarios. And with that, I just want to wrap up with um, one more quick slide. 
um, of course, there's a lot of a lot of fun things in the tool, um, and I just wanted to to point towards some some future work that um, Igloo USA is embarking on under the U.S. Department of Energy City Sleep Program, uh, where we are working with a number of cities to develop a, a framework to uh, kind of bring together both that top level inventory based view and the individual project based uh, view and sort of uh, create a framework where you can look at them together and, and really understand what were the impacts of uh, the relative impact of individual projects uh, versus those kind of external drivers, uh, whether it's you know, weather or, or, or other things that are uh, impacting the, the total uh, emissions over time. Um, and that is uh, it for me. So I'm now going to turn it over to Eric. Thank you, Michael. Uh, that provides an excellent segue into what we're going to be talking about with our portfolio manager, because portfolio manager does provide that kind of project level uh, view of down down to the building level. Uh, but before we get into that, I wanted to give you a, an overview. Um, I'm Eric Schambarger with the City of Milwaukee. I'm joined by Rose Buss. Uh, we work for the Environmental Collaboration Office, or ECO, where our goal is to make Milwaukee a world-class eco city. And that comes from a charge from our mayor, uh, Mayor Tom Barrett. Uh, we are a proud partner of Sustainable Energy for All. And as a building efficiency accelerator city, we're excited about this opportunity to tell you what we're doing in Milwaukee. Uh, there's a little photo there of a green roof with solar uh, on one of our, our public housing authority buildings. Um, so just briefly, our office. Uh, takes on what we call the new triple bottom line, ecology, economy, and what I like to call eco-immunity. And uh, the notion is that you know we can create programs and policies that are really strong for our economy uh, while protecting our long-term ecology that's so important for our, our sustainability long-term, and, and we can build a real movement around it uh, with people. Uh, we have a number of programs from manufacturing to residential to commercial, all uh, focused on renewable energy and, and clean energy as a part of our uh, real practical things we do to, to tackle uh, climate change. Um, we take seriously the eight-step process that uh, the World Resources Institute has, has put in place. Um, we are leading by example through city operations. Uh, the, we participate in what's called the Better Buildings Challenge. That's something that the United States uh, Department of Energy put together, and it's a program to encourage businesses and municipalities to cut energy use by 20% over a decade. And we took that pledge for municipal buildings in 2012. We're at about 11% reduction in our municipal facilities. And now we are uh, expanded that to the commercial sector as well. Um, the tool we use to track energy use is Portfolio Manager. It's a free tool that uh, is established by the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency that provides a, uh, a building level and portfolio view of buildings and, and how you're doing on energy use. And Rose will really get into the details uh, on that. Um, but tracking energy use is only part of it. We also have an internal team that drives action, identifying projects, and, and, and then funding them as well to actually make, make the change that we, we seek. So I mentioned this Better Buildings Challenge. Uh, we, we started to expand it to commercial buildings. We got 11 partners to make this happen um, with our setup. Here we, we really rely on external partners and, and associations of buildings to, to make this a, as much of a market-driven uh, program as possible. So we provide some tools and resources, but we're really relying on uh, generating excitement in the commercial building sector uh, to do energy efficiency and also take that pledge building by building, having each building recognize that energy efficiency is, is good for business, it's, it can drive profitability, and, uh, and tenant engagement. Uh, I mentioned the eight city level actions to improve building efficiency. I've circled the ones that, that we've kind of bundled under this Better Buildings Challenge rubric. We've, we've set targets, this 20% reduction goal. Uh, so that, that's a goal that applies to each building that takes the challenge. They're committing to cut energy use 20% over a decade. Uh, we provide incentives and a unique financing program called PACE. I mentioned the government leadership by example. Uh, but we re also really want to engage building owners. Uh, and Rose is going to talk about how we're using data to not just be a, um, 
a boring exercise, frankly, but a way to really drive uh, engagement of building owners. And then we're providing the technical and financial resources to help building owners through this process. Uh, with that, I will turn it over to Rose. Great. Thanks, Eric. So Eric mentioned a little bit of this already, but just a little bit of a background of how this program came about. Um, at the end of last year, we received an award from the Department of Energy for $750,000 to expand our municipal program to the commercial sector. This, this shift will take place over three years. As Eric mentioned, it has 10 to 11 partners that we work with to execute various pieces of the program. And um, over the course of the three years, we're hoping to impact 200 buildings. For 2016, we want to have 10 million square feet of um, privately held um, buildings enrolled in our, in our program and taking that 20% um, reduction pledge. Right now, we're focused on Class B and C office buildings, small commercial buildings, and K through 12 schools. So basically, this award is allowing us to develop a comprehensive energy efficiency program that provides all of the tools and resources that property owners and building managers need to develop and implement their projects. This slide just gives an overview of the value that we see um, this program built, bringing to those buildings and um, why, kind of the why of we're asking for progress tracking. So this program is going to be guiding buildings through the entire process of developing an energy efficiency project and preparing them to implement those projects. Um, we're leveraging available resources through our partners. Um, and the participating buildings are going to be eligible for awards and recognition. And you know, kind of the, the largest value, the most tangible value, will be showing that the implemented projects save money on energy bills and operations and maintenance costs. We're supporting this through ongoing networking and educational opportunities for many audiences. And Overall, we also want to see that there's increased employee and occupant satisfaction and productivity. So how we're selling the progress tracking piece of this, um, there are kind of three main components. Um, the first is knowledge. We really want to give the buildings insight into their energy use and how the building is operating at a consistent interval. And this is possible when they're keeping it up on a regular basis. The second piece is the marketing and recognition piece. Um, so by tracking their progress and sharing, which I'll show you in the Portfolio Manager um, program, um, we're able to highlight their completed work and reward the buildings for the different accomplishments that they meet. Um, and this is something that we hope that they'll also be able to leverage when marketing their own buildings to get tenants or potential buyers, um, things of that nature. The third piece is the operations and maintenance support that comes along with this. The, the operations and maintenance teams are what really are driving um, you know, the performance of the building and making sure that things are kept up. And we want to make sure they know that they're not in it alone. We have a number of resources to help with the tracking and to make it easy to answer any questions they have. Um, one example is an event that we've been calling a benchmarking jam. And this is held by one of our partners um, throughout the year where buildings can bring in questions, their utility bills, et cetera, for technical assistance with the tracking program. So with that, um, our tool of choice is Portfolio Manager. Eric mentioned a little bit about it um, in terms of how the city uses it. Um, it is, as he said, it is free to use and it's continually being improved with new functions. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how, um, how we are planning and how we are currently using the tool with our, our commercial buildings. So there are a few main points um, and benefits to using the tool. One is it gives an overall portfolio of view. So this is helpful when there are you know, management companies or just um, organizations that have multiple buildings. Um, you get down to the individual building progress to pinpoint where your biggest opportunities will be. It has easy data entry, which is important because you, people usually don't want to learn a new program and spend a lot of time figuring out how to put their numbers in the system. You're able to set goals, which for the purpose of our program, it's defaulted to 20% below a set baseline um, to track over 10 years, um, but they can set other goals as well. You can track projects, individual projects, with your costs and estimate energy savings to help pinpoint, um, you know, if you see a, a dip in your energy use and you go back into your history, you can see, oh, it could possibly be because of this project. 
Um, and there are sharing capabilities, which um, is how the city is utilizing it to hold people accountable and market the successes that we see. Um, one thing I want to know is that this is available for global use, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the differences um, that there are for, for the international community, but it is something that is available um, for everyone. So with that, I'm going to bring us into Portfolio Manager just to um, take a peek at some of those things that I mentioned. So this is the home page, um, and I want to draw your attention to the left side of the screen. And this is um, the basics of how to get started and all of the help resources that are available. Portfolio Manager has an extensive library of help documents for users that are easy to understand and can walk through step by step. They also have um, all these tools and resources and training at the top. And there are also webinar sessions where people can log in and um, talk to people from, from the portfolio manager team about any questions they have. So I'm just going to log in here to give you a, a look at the interface. Um, oops. Let me try one more time. All right, there we go. So this is the, the main screen. And this, once it loads up, it's going to give an overall view of all of the properties in our portfolio. Um, you can see that we have 166. Um, you can create different lists um, to sort. So that's really important for our purposes when we're looking at commercial versus municipal buildings. And there will be a couple of graphs that pop up that show um, your overall source energy use int intensity, which is your KBTUs per square foot. Um, and it's adjusted for losses from the power plant through distribution, transmission, et cetera. And then there's also a graph of the greenhouse gas emissions. Um, you'll see all of the, everything in blue is a link that you can click on. Um, it's something that you can get definitions and then it will link out to more pages, et cetera. So, um, so those are kind of a nice overview. You can then click into individual buildings. Um, and this is basically where we're at with the program. We don't have a lot of external portfolios enrolled yet. Um, usually it's building by building, but you get the same kind of picture. You get your EUI over time, greenhouse gas emissions over time. Um, so the same same types of graphs that you have from your overall portfolio. Um, and then, you know, you can log your, your property details. Um, and it has these nice little um, exclamation points. So if something doesn't map up, you know there's something that you need to fix. Um, the, as I mentioned, the data entry is really easy. There's the energy tab. You have your different meters for energy use. And when you click into there, um, it's really easy to add another entry manually. Um, it, there's, it automatically pulls in your last date, so you would just have to change the ending date based on your current utility bill. And then there's three or two other um, pieces of information that you pull from your utility bill for your electric and your gas, so it's really simple. Um, as part of the program, the participating buildings um, get us to set up their account for them, so we'll do all that historical entry, which is nice, but they also have an, imp uh, an easy import process as well. So we, we generally encourage buildings to do this when they're paying their bills and have the person that um, is, is paying those bills do the entry because they already have the bill out and um, it, it, um, it makes it easy to just go in and add these two numbers. The other piece I want to show you is the goal setting. So like I said, we utilize this um, to set their goal for 20% below a baseline. So they have a metric comparison here. They show you what your baseline is. Um, where you're at currently and what your target is based on your goals. Here you can see the different goals and there are a number that you can set um, and we set it at 20% below the baseline. There's also a project tracking and this is something that we're early in the process of using with our commercial buildings. Um, this is an example of one for our city building and this is going to give us the, um, the first look into what the buildings have been doing and to help as a starting point for the marketing and recognition piece of the program. You can also see as you build it up what your total project investment is and total lifetime savings um, and kind of keep track of that. Um, 
The other, the other nice piece about this program is that you can share, share your building with other um, users. So we are connecting um, all of the, I guess I'm going to go back here, um, all of the individual buildings to this city account so that we have um, a look into their, into what, what's going on in their building. When we set it up, we set up the participant accounts and the, con the correct connections so they don't have to worry about that. If people already have an account, there are some buildings that have started using this on their own, we provide them instructions to, to connect with us. Um, and this is for sharing internally with ourselves and externally to the buildings, and there's a two-step process for that. So that's kind of just a, a brief look of how, how we've been using the tool. And like I mentioned, again, it, it is available for global use. There are a few caveats with that. Um, you know, it, the score is compared to U.S. buildings, and right now buildings outside of the U.S. are not eligible to get an Energy Star certification. Um, and there are some systematic differences, but it, it is bringing it back to the same baseline. Um, another difference is the source energy conversion factor is based on U.S. averages. Um, if you have somewhere that is using a lot of wind or solar, those conversion factors would be different. Um, but again, at least in the system, everything is cons consistent for you. So there's a link there, um, a shortened link. So if you'd like to look at the, the questions for that, um, you can feel free. Um, and that's, that's all I have. Um, that's our overview of Portfolio Manager. So I'm going to turn this back over to Senna. Thank you very much, Eric and Rose, for sharing experience from the city of Milwaukee. And uh, thank you to all the speakers uh, for this exciting uh, overviews of uh, abilities of different tools to track progress. I'll uh, give a brief summary before we will go to questions and answers. So today we heard from Shannon about Building Efficiency Accelerator, a multi-stakeholder initiative which works with numerous partners to assist cities around the world to design and implement energy efficiency policies and projects. Then I gave a brief overview of Copenhagen Center's work on mapping tools on energy efficiency in buildings, and I encourage you to visit our knowledge management system uh, and have a look at uh, the working paper for more details. Alex showed us the opportunities of greenhouse gas emissions protocol on estimating emissions effects from various policy options, mapping the casual chains and uh, evaluating the impacts of uh, policy interactions uh, with the tool. Michael introduced us to ClearPath inventory tool, which uh, integrates a set of indicators to track greenhouse gas emissions and also helps to develop scenarios for, for the future to see the impact of actions in relation to business as usual and estimate the effect of a number of individual actions. And finally, and we heard from Eric and Rose about exciting programs on energy efficiency in buildings in the city of Milwaukee and their approach to track uh, the progress in the city. We learned about the features of Portfolio Manager tool and it was great to learn that tracking results can be used in the city to award for the accomplishments in terms of energy and greenhouse gas emission savings. Um, and we uh, saw um, how um, energy use and emissions uh, can be tracked over time for individual buildings and certain goals for energy savings can be set with the Portfolio Manager tool. So thank you again for all your contributions. It uh, has been really uh, fruitful uh, presentations. And now I would like to open the floor for questions. And we have received a number of questions already. So I will be announcing them. Um, probably we'll start with Shannon. Uh, Shannon, the question to you, does uh, building efficiency accelerator work with energy efficiency only on the demand side or there are some projects on the energy supply side as well, especially concerning renewable energy? Please, Shannon. Thanks, Senia. Um, currently, the accelerator does not work on the um, supply side. We're working primarily with um, cities on policies and projects regarding energy demand and energy efficiency in, for instance, municipal buildings um, and incentive programs for the private sector. We are considering um, having collaborations with supply side projects, and in fact, here at WRI, 
we have a large renewable area of work um, on our energy team that we're exploring collaborations with. But as of, as of now, we don't have um, specific projects on the supply side. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, the next question is to Alex. Uh, Alex, I know that you responded to some of them, but I think it will be useful um, to hear your response to some of the questions you got so that all participants can hear. Um, so Alex, uh, concerning your tool which you presented, is it possible to estimate energy savings as well as greenhouse gas emissions for different policy options with greenhouse gas emissions protocol? Yeah, thank you. Uh, and it was a good question as well. Um, so the, just as a little bit of background, the accounting and reporting uh, frameworks that are presented here as, as, as standards um, are often accompanied by a series of tools or, or include a level of guidance on data collection. Um, and the energy savings or estimates of energy savings would um, typically come from kind of that data underpinning a greenhouse gas um, calculation. Um, and so, so that often goes hand in hand. Um, although the, the standard itself doesn't have much explicit guidance on, um, on that necessarily per se, um, but, but the activities that go in uh, would closely mirror what is included in the standard and, and for a kind of a robust and systematic accounting of um, energy savings specifically, uh, that process would likely mirror uh, the same as a GHG accounting of, of those emissions. Great, Alex. Thank you very much. And um, we've got another question to you as well, if you can reply briefly. It's about uh, national determined contributions under the Paris Agreement and how uh, greenhouse gas emissions protocol can help or if uh, it can actually help um, to assess policies and activities under NDCs. Yeah, um, and there's another good question. Um, I know that during the development of this standard and a couple of the other standards, like the mitigation goal standard, um, that there were kind of a wide um, kind of a consortium of, of pilots, pilot testers and pilot users that were considered and brought on uh, into the advisory committee for the development of these. Um, and that ranged from uh, city governments, local actors, all the way up to national government actors as well. Um, and so it was built in with, with the idea of being applicable kind of at all levels and, and through the development of, of creating just a very robust standard that kind of covers all the bases needed for a transparent and robust accounting of, of these kind of policy um, greenhouse gas effects. And, and so it is, I believe, being used in, in a couple initiatives that WRI is involved in and in, in some others um, to, to kind of support the um, work on NDCs. Uh, so I know the, I think the climate, um, was it transparent, was the climate action transparency, ICAT, Initiative for Climate Action Transparency, um, and also the recently launched NDC partnership um, with which WRI is, is, I think, involved in both of those, use both the policy and action standard and the mitigation goal standard to help support um, at a much higher level, I guess, the, um, the, the NDCs and, and the tracking of, of specific policies at the national level. Um, but again, it was, it was made with the intention of being broadly applicable, really, at kind of every, every level and scale um, where greenhouse gas policies are, or policies are affecting greenhouse gases. Thank you. Thank you very much, Alex, for this very comprehensive answer. Um, I'll hand over to Michael. We have a couple of questions to you. And um, the first one is, um, um, in the situation when the data is not available for some of the indicators required by clear paths, how a city can solve the problem of these data gaps and still create an inventory using the clear path tool? Yeah, that's a that's a great question. Um, you know, one thing that that I, I guess I'll, I'll point out that I didn't mention in my my written response is that the the indicators um, are not uh, necessarily a required portion of the inventory. So, for example, they're not um, a required uh, under the the GPC, for example. Um, so, you know, in that case, you. you 
it's a, I would say a best practice rather than, than a requirement. So if you're not able to necessarily get the indicator data now, um, I think it's a, a matter of, of trying to, to look forward to um, developing the right data collection mechanisms over time um, to be able to get that kind of information uh, incorporated into the effort. Um, if it's about, if the question is also sort of getting at um, just sort of data gaps for the basic inventory calculations themselves in terms of um, you know, how much energy actually gets used or, or how much traffic is on the roads, for example. Um, you know, the, the, the protocols do allow for um, some other more top-down ways of, of estimating that from uh, potentially downscaling from national level statistics. Um, however, it, it's of course always important to uh, indicate whenever you do so uh, that those are, are lower um, quality activity data that, that drove that um, initial calculation uh, and there are ways within the tool to, to indicate that and make sure that that's part of what gets reported. Um, you know, with the idea to uh, eventually, you know, as I said, developing the, the right data collection mechanisms to improve data quality over time. Thank you, Michael. Uh, we have another um, question to you. Um, um, what a um, is it possible to use a finer time intervals when using clear paths? For example, not only the yearly basis, but also quarterly or monthly for creating inventories. Sure, that's a that's a great question. Um, it does uh, do well. It was designed with this sort of annual uh, number as. Um, uh, kind of the basic unit of time that it works with. Um, that said, there there really isn't any reason why you couldn't uh, create monthly, um, say, residential energy uh, inputs if you cover all 12 months. Um, you know, when the the tool goes to do the sort of summer reporting on what went into the, the entire inventory, but I'll just add up all all 12 months. So you certainly could. Uh, enter your data in at that that lower resolution, and that's um, something that we're looking forward to to um, making hopefully more explicit um, and supporting, especially as we uh, work on things regarding you know normalizing energy use for weather patterns, and that's of course best done on a on a monthly basis and, and finer timelines than, than annual. Um, so you know we're we're looking forward to that. Um, but but again you, you can enter in the, your data at smaller time scales. Great. Thank you very much. Um, I turn to uh, Rose and Eric from the city of Milwaukee. Um, the first question uh, sounds like this. Clearly, Milwaukee is at the forefront and on a path to improving building efficiency in the U.S. How does it view its role in sharing lessons learned and supporting other cities wanting to follow its ambitious pathway? Please, Eric or Rose. Sure. No, that's a, a good question. Um, I'd like to say, you know, there are many cities in the country in the United States that are still committed to climate action despite. Um, other strange events in our country, but um, you know, there, I'm in the Urban Sustainability Directors Network, and I, I know there are cities around the country that uh, are taking taking this seriously and will continue to press forward with uh, aggressive climate action. But you know, we really see our role um, is as a leader, but also we want to kind of show what works. And one of the the big lessons that I think I would highlight from our from our presentation is that you know as a government official uh, I care about the, the overall metrics on climate change and stuff like that but when you're really trying to engage building owners and the general public you have to find creative ways to uh, to make managing energy data exciting and that's not easy 
Um, but we're trying to do that through giving recognition and awards and, and those kinds of things to building owners that are, that are taking this seriously um, to really try to create a market dynamic out there that uh, the buildings that are taking this seriously are, are better to, at attracting tenants and can kind of become more profitable. So we're trying to speak the language of, of building owners, um, not just government people that are trying to look, you know, look at the big picture on, on carbon emissions. So that's probably the single biggest um, recommendation I would make to other cities is to try to be creative in engaging the public, but then also you know, really thinking through all the different reasons that a building owner would say no to energy efficiency and trying to come up with answers. And that's where I feel like the eight-step process that WRI has come up with is is really valuable to, you know, to show the cities leading by example that we're putting our money where our mouth is to provide financing and the technical resources and the, all of those things are, are necessary to really get the change that I think globally uh, we all know is, is important to tackle climate threats that are out there. Thank you, Eric. Um, one more question, uh, probably for Rose, because it's about portfolio manager. Um, is energy use or emissions per square foot a useful metric uh, for different building types? It seems like it could skew buildings like indoor pools, churches, theaters, etc. Yeah, so um, the purpose of doing the energy use per square foot is to make make the buildings comparable, um, but that's also where the use type comes into play. So when you select what type of use your, pro your building is, so whether it's an office building or um, there's a public assembly category, there's um, schools, uh, there's I think I think 80 different building types um, that you can choose from, you're then being compared um, to just those buildings, just that building type across the country. Um, when you're looking at um, the Energy Star score, when you're here in the U.S., you're, that's a percentile score, and it's based on just buildings similar to your own. So it's it's not comparing an office building to a school. You're just comparing schools, so apples to apples. Um, so that's something that's built into the program. Um, but then the uh, when you're looking across a portfolio, the, the energy use per square foot comes into play because you can see which buildings are using energy more efficiently than others and it helps you identify where you might want to start when you're making the changes. Great, thank you very much, Rose. Um, we're coming to the end of uh, the webinar, but we probably still have time for one more question. Um, and I think it's an interesting one because it probably can be addressed by various speakers who presented the case studies for different tools. Um, the question is the following. Any of the tools presented today can help to track progress of a renovation project of several buildings in order to make them more energy efficient. So I open the floor for uh, anyone who can uh, who want to start talking about how their tool can help with the renovation project and tracking its progress. Senia, can you um, rephrase the question a little bit? We're not quite sure what um, what you're looking for. Um, I think uh, the question is about um, if uh, several buildings in a, let's say, in a certain city uh, have to be renovated uh, to higher level of energy efficiency, how can the city uh, track the progress during this project and make sure that the objectives of the project are achieved and maybe how to report the lessons learned from this project using different tools which we heard of today? Sure. Um, so one way that um, we're going to be utilizing this is, um, like I said, we have the, the energy use shared with the city. So we'll be developing some case studies to promote um, different projects that are done um, in various buildings. We actually have a number of buildings 
that are undergoing significant renovations in our program right now. Um, so we'll be using that. We also are encouraging them to fill out that, that project tracking space so that we can um, keep an eye on that and we'll have um, regular communication with those buildings to talk about what they've been doing. Um, there's also a piece in the in the portfolio manager that you can play around with what different um, types of projects might do to your energy. I didn't I didn't show that piece, but it's kind of in that um, goals and there's a design tab as well. Um, so it can uh, help buildings look at what some best options might be. Um, I don't know if that if that sufficiently answers the question, but that's how we're using portfolio manager. For that purpose. Thank you very much. Yeah, Michael, please go ahead. Well, I will just add on. I mean, I I think for that particular use case, a portfolio manager probably is the the best one for you know, if you're really looking at an individual project. Um, and I would recommend um, certainly to the extent possible before implementing the project, if you can do the kind of benchmarking. Uh, types of functions that portfolio manager provides, um, maybe well, hopefully at a at a resolution of the individual buildings and maybe across the entire portfolio as well, um, so that you have something before the action took place to really compare it against. And I, I'll just add on to that really quickly. And um, one thing I didn't show in the project tracking piece of portfolio manager is that you do put in an implementation date. So even if you don't have the utility data in there beforehand, you can, you know, go back and populate previous data, and then it it sets an implement a pre and post implementation period. Um, and we just entered our first one, so we're not I'm not quite sure what what shows up, um, but it tracks it for about a year afterwards um, as your post implementation. So it does give you that time frame, um, which is helpful. And these are really valuable suggestions. Uh, thank you very much, Rose and Michael. And from our side, I, I probably would uh, um, refer again to the working paper uh, because it identifies several tools which uh, can specifically be dealing with renovation projects and tracking the progress for existing buildings. Um, in, you will find details in the working paper, there is a number of uh, tools. I think uh, we're coming to the very end of uh, our webinar and there might have been several questions which we didn't manage to address today online, but uh, we will uh, try to answer it uh, via email directly to the people who asked them. I would like again to thank all uh, the speakers today for exciting uh, lessons learned, experiences sharing, and uh, presentation of uh, various tools and their opportunities. And of course, I would like to thank all the participants who joined and uh, stayed throughout the whole webinar. Just a quick reminder, when you will be logging off, there will be a, a brief survey, so if you can spend a couple of seconds, it's really sure to answer a few questions. It will be really helpful for us. So this concludes this webinar. Thank you very much and hopefully to see you again during our next webinars.